good evening viewers clearing prelims is a mammoth task for many right but why worry when you have shankara is academy with you yes our pre storming program is aimed to facilitate this process pre storming is the most reliable prelims test series offered by shankara is academy and already two batches are going on successfully and the third batch has commenced today with its orientation and the first test will start on 20th november Hurry up and join in this test batch as soon as possible to enhance your prelim score. So with this happy note, now let's start our Hindu news analysis for the date 9th of November 2022. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we have chosen for today's discussion. See today we had covered nearly 8 topics, so pay attention and make note of each and every discussion. Now have a look at this article. It says that India's first privately developed rocket Vikram S is undergoing final preparations for launch in Sri Harikota. So this is about the news article given here and in this context we will understand about Vikram S from our preliminary perspective. See first of all know that Vikram S is the first privately developed rocket launch vehicle. It was developed by Hyderabad based Skyroot. See Skyroot no has been developing three variants of the Vikram rocket. The first one is Vikram 1 and it can carry 480 kg payload to 500 km low inclination orbit and it can carry 290 kg payload to 500 km sun synchronous polar orbits. And the second one is Vikram 2. It is equipped to lift off with 595 kilograms of cargo to low inclination orbit and 400 kg to 500 km sun synchronous polar orbits. Finally, take the Vikram 3. It can launch with 815 kg to 500 km low inclination orbit and 560 kg to 500 km sun synchronous polar orbits. So these are the variants that are developed by Skyroot. and they are named as vikram so that it is as a tribute to the vikram sarabhai the father of the indian space program and founder of isro okay now the vikram s rocket that was developed is a single stage sub orbital launch vehicle and it is the maiden mission of skyroot aerospace named prararam see prararam means the beginning now coming to vikram s it will carry three customer payloads among them one is from students See Space Kids a Chennai based aerospace startup will fly Fun Sat and this is on the suborbital flight on board Vikram S see it is a 2.5 kg payload developed by students from India the US Singapore and Indonesia now coming to its significance say Vikram S will help in testing and validating the majority of the technologies in the Vikram series of space launch vehicles If Prararam is successful, Skyroot Aerospace will become the first private space company in India to launch a rocket into space. So this will mark the beginning of a new era for the Indian space sector, which was opened up for the commercialization in 2020. Okay? So that's all about this news article. See in this news article, we saw about an important topic for your prelims that is Vikram S. and also note that this vikram s is showing that we are opening up the space sector to the private so even this can be utilized in your mains answers because this is also a kind of privatization am i right so wherever you want to use where all privatization is happening use this point okay so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion Now have a look at this news article it talks about the recently held air force exercise Garuda 7 the article also mentions about two indigenous aircrafts and their participation in the exercise so this is the crux of the article given here in this context let's learn about Garuda 7 and also about the two aircrafts mentioned in the article okay now coming to the air exercise Garuda 7 See it is a joint bilateral air exercise between Indian Air Force and French Air Force. This is the 7th edition of the bilateral exercise between the two countries. The first, third and the fourth editions were conducted in India in the year 2003, 6 and 14. It was conducted at air force stations at Gwalior, Kalaikunda and Jodhpur respectively. Okay? See the second, fourth and sixth editions no were conducted in France. This was in the year 2005, 2010 and 2019. Understood? Now, the outcome of the exercise is that it will promote professional interaction between the air forces of the two countries. 
so this will involve exchange of experiences and enhancement of operational knowledge see this exercise will be a step in strengthening the bilateral relations between the two countries which is india and france so this is all about the exercise garuda 7 Now coming to the two indigenous aircrafts being involved in the exercise the two aircrafts are Tejas and Prachand here note that both Tejas and Prachand are indigenously developed aircrafts belonging to India now let's first see about Tejas Tejas is a light combat aircraft designed and developed by Hindustan Aeronautical Limited it is a supersonic aircraft which means that it can travel faster than the speed of sound now what about Prachand Pay attention here because this light combat helicopter was launched only recently. See, Prachand is designed, developed, and extensively test flown for over a decade by Hindustan Aeronautical Limited. The multi-role attack helicopter has been customized as per the requirements of the Indian Armed Forces, and this is to operate both in desert terrains and high altitude sectors. See the light combat helicopter is the only attack helicopter in the world that can land and take off at an altitude of 5000 meters. So this makes it ideal to operate in the high altitude areas of the Siachen glacier, okay? So this is all about the Prachand. Now that's all about this news article. We had covered about Garuda 7 Tejas Prachand. See all these no can be directly put in your preliminary question because all these are currently occurring in news and so you can expect preliminary question based on these topics. And based on this Prachand and all you can definitely expect a question. So with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this editorial article. It talks about the Agnipath scheme. The author feels that this is the right time to analyze the scheme without any bias since the noise surrounding the scheme has finally subsided. So this is the crux of the news article given here and in this context let us learn about the Agnipath scheme, advantages of it as discussed by the author in this news article and also some of the disadvantages associated with the scheme. Before that the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here for your reference kindly go through it Firstly what is Agnipath scheme it is a defense personnel recruitment scheme under which 45000 to 50000 soldiers will be recruited annually here note that most of them will leave the service in just 4 years of the total annual recruits only 25% will be allowed to continue for another 15 years and a permanent commission The most important thing to note here is the new system of recruitment under the Agnipath scheme is only for personnel below officer ranks. Non-officer rank personnel denote those who do not join the forces as commissioned officers. Now coming to the term commissioned officers, it refers to those who have been selected permanently for working with the armed forces with a rank assigned to them. It generally refers to the leadership position. So the recruits under the scheme will perform only executive tasks since the leadership position are reserved for commissioned officers okay now coming to the eligibility criteria to become agnivirs see under the agnipath scheme aspirants between the ages of 17.5 years and 21 years will be eligible to apply For the recruitment year 2022 to 2023 the upper age limit has been increased from 21 to 23 years old okay and the recruitment standards will remain the same and recruitment will be done twice a year through recruitment rallies organized across the country okay now coming to the question what happens after selection Once selected the aspirants will go through training for 6 months and then will be deployed for 3 and a half years to perform their duties as defense personnel during this period they will get a starting salary of rupees 30000 along with additional benefits which will go up to rupees 40000 by the end of the fourth year service importantly during this period 30% of the salary will be set aside under a seva nidhi program and the government will contribute an equal amount every month and it will also accrue interest at the end of the 4 year period each soldier will get rupees 11.71 lakh as a lump sum amount which will be tax free they will also get a rupees 48 lakh life insurance cover for the 4 years in case of death the payout will be over rupees 1 crore including pay for unserved tenure okay 
However, as said earlier, after four years, only 25% of the batch will be recruited back into their respective services for a period of 15 years. Okay. For those who are reselected, the initial four-year period will not be considered for retirement benefits. Okay. And this is all you need to know about this Agnipath scheme. So you can see that I have covered it holistically from the eligibility criteria to the salary package. Now let's see why the Agnipath scheme was introduced and also about the advantages associated with this. Firstly, the average age of armed forces in India, which has a total number of 1.4 million personnel, is 32 years today. But this will go down to 26 in the next 6 to 7 years due to the implementation of Agnipath scheme. So this is the first advantage of implementing Agnipath scheme. Secondly, it is said that Agnipath will increase employment opportunities for the youth in the country. Skills and experience acquired during the four-year service will enable such soldiers to get employment in various fields after the end of their stint with the force. This will also lead to the availability of a higher skilled workforce to the economy, which will be helpful in productivity gain and overall GDP growth of our country. Thirdly, high pension burden for the government regarding the armed forces can be brought down with the introduction of Agnipath scheme. This is because only 25% of Agnivis getting retained as permanent officers each year. Here, one important point to note that is, India pays more for the pension of retired soldiers than the amount it pays for its current serving ones. This will be changed if Agnipath gets implemented. So these are the advantages associated with the scheme. But it has some disadvantages as well. Firstly, temporary nature of employment provided by the scheme is an issue. See, the Agnipath scheme will provide employment to the youth of our country only for four years, no? What will they do after that? It's not explained clearly. So this is a disadvantage. Secondly, since the recruits are appointed for a temporary period, there will be no pension for the Agnivis post-retirement. And thirdly, opponents of the scheme claim that six months of training provided will be of inadequate nature for the demands of the armed forces. So these are all the disadvantages associated with the Agnipath scheme. Now coming back to what is discussed in the editorial, see the author says that Agnivirs, even though retired for only 4 years, are imbued with discipline and military values which will be of benefit to the nation, the armed forces and also to the individual. And he concludes the article by saying that all new schemes which alter the status quo will have problems associated with them. Course correction can be effected midway by taking in the feedbacks and this can also be done through Agnipath scheme. So this is all about this news article. So through this article we learned about the Agnipath scheme and also about its advantages and disadvantages. Also, we saw what are the points that the author is referring, okay? So, in this discussion, we had covered the Agnipath scheme holistically, which will be very much helpful for both your preliminary as well as mains examination, okay? And with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. See, have a look at this news article. It is about the writ petition filed by an accident victim. The victim was seeking the state government to give him compensation for the injury sustained in a hit and run accident. So the Kerala High Court held that it is the duty of the claims inquiry officer under the Solashium Scheme 1989 to obtain a copy of the FIR inquest report, postmortem or certificate of injury from the authorities. This is about the article given here and in this context let us understand about the Solashium Scheme and the modifications made in it. See, the basis for the Solashim Scheme is Section 163 of the Motor Vehicles Act 1988. It says that the central government may by notification make a scheme for the compensation in case of a hit and run motor accidents. So as per the section, Solashim Scheme was established in 1989. But the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways has notified a new scheme for the compensation of victims of hit and run motor accidents. And it is said that this new scheme will supersede the Salashim scheme from 1st of April 2022 onwards. So under this scheme, an applicant shall submit an application seeking compensation to the claims inquiry officer of the subdivision or taluka in which the accident took place. They can submit the application through electronic means also. 
and on the receipt of the application it is the duty of the claims inquiry officer to obtain a copy of the first accident report post mortem report and whole inquiry in respect of the claims and he or she should submit the application to the claim settlement officer within a period of 1 month from the date of receipt of the application and the claim settlement commissioner should sanction the claim this is within a period of 15 days from the date of receipt of report from the claims inquiry officer see this is the process that is followed in giving compensation for hit and run motor accidents here we just saw the broad process but know that it involves many conditions and rules to be followed before giving such compensation we'll see that in some of the discussion but now finally note that the new scheme enhanced the compensation given the amount has been increased from rupees 12500 to 50000 for grievous hurt and in case of death no it has been increased from 25000 to rupees 2 lakh and the other notable change is that the ministry of road transport and highways has published the rules on february 2022 regarding the creation operation sources of fund of the motor vehicles accident fund see this fund you know will be used for providing compensation in case of hit and run accident treatment for accident victims and other purposes okay so that's all about this news article so through this news article discussion we had been aware of this compensation for the hit and run accident now we all know that there is a compensation that is to be given by the government in case of hit and run accidents see these all you can utilize in your main answers also when you get such a scheme based question in your prelims you can easily answer with this information this is more than enough so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article Our Prime Minister Mr Modi unveiled the logo theme and website of G20 presidency during an online event. Here you can have a look at the logo and the website. The theme of India's G20 presidency is Vasudeva Kudumbakam or one earth one family one future. Okay? As you know India will assume the presidency of the powerful grouping from the current chair Indonesia on December 1 knowing about G20 presidency is very important so in this news article discussion let us learn some of the facts that you must remember when it comes to G20 presidency before that remember the group of 20 or G20 is a grouping of the world's 20 largest economies Here in this image you can see the members of the grouping here you can see that india is a member of the grouping am i right yes india is also a founding member of the g20 now g20 is very important because its members represent almost 90% of global gdp and 80% of international global trade and also note that two third of the world's population live in g20 countries and 84% of all the fossil fuel emissions are produced by this g20 countries only with this basic information let us see a few facts about the presidency of the g20 see the presidency of g20 rotates every year among its members and a unique thing about g20 presidency is that the country that holds a presidency works together with its predecessor and a successor So this grouping inside G20 grouping is known as Troika. See G20 have such arrangement to ensure the continuity of the agenda. Currently Italy, Indonesia and India are the Troika countries. And on December 1 India will assume the presidency from the current chair Indonesia. Okay? Remember the G20 has no permanent secretariat. that is the agenda and the working coordination is completed by g20 leaders personal representatives known as sherpas and they together work with the finance ministers and the central bank governors to complete the works okay so being president of g20 india will have the opportunity to assume center stage in proposing and setting the global agenda and discourse Secondly since G20 represents more than 80% of the world's GDP India can play a strategic role in securing global economic growth and prosperity Thirdly G20 will be the platform to test India's leadership potential and diplomatic foresight in organizing such a big event and in arriving at meaningful outcomes Okay 
So that's all about this news article. See in this news article discussion, we discussed about a very important topic, which is G20. And see, this is going to be often in the news because India is taking its presidency now. Okay. So there are more possibility of getting a preliminary question as well as in mains. You might have a question like, what is the significance for India as being the G20 president? Okay. So for that also, I had discussed in this discussion itself. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this news article. This news article talks about the newly notified Kaveri South Wildlife Sanctuary. See by this notification, the Kaveri South Wildlife Sanctuary became the 17th wildlife sanctuary in Tamil Nadu. And that is why it is in news today. So in this news article discussion, let us see few facts about this newly notified wildlife sanctuary. Okay. See, let's begin with the location of the sanctuary. The Kaveri South Wildlife Sanctuary will connect Kaveri North Wildlife Sanctuary of Tamil Nadu with the Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary in the state of Karnataka. To be very specific, the government of Tamil Nadu have notified an area of 686.405 square kilometer reserve forest in Krishnagiri and Dharmapuri districts as Kaveri South Wildlife Sanctuary. Thereby, it forms a large contiguous network of protected areas for wildlife. Remember, the region is declared as Wildlife Sanctuary under Section 26A of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. Okay. Now let us see some of the significance of this notification. See the Kaveri South Wildlife Sanctuary has unique ecological, faunal and floral significance and it is also an important elephant habitat in southern India. Okay. See this area has two important and large elephant corridors namely the Nandimangalam Ulibanda Corridor and the Kovaipalam and Annibiddahalla Corridor. See, the area is critical for many riverine species dependent on river Kaveri. Like you can say the late soft shell turtles, smooth coated otter and marsh crocodile etc etc. And it is also having the potential to support conservation of leopards and other red listed large carnivores. Thirdly, this landscape maintains further continuity to the Nilgiri biosphere. This is through the Mahadeshwara Wildlife Sanctuary, Bilikiri Rangaswamy Temple Tiger Reserve in Karnataka and Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve in the Eero district. So this sanctuary provides sufficient area for the conservation of the varied and rich biodiversity of the region. And finally, since the forested areas of the sanctuary are part of the prey base, efforts taken to conserve tigers in contiguous areas such as the Biligiri Ranganatha Temple Tiger Reserve, Satyamangalam Tiger Reserve have created a spillover effect. That is, tigers have begun to occupy their traditional ranges in the region where they had been locally extinct for a few decades. Okay. So that's all about this news article. Through this news article, you had known about a very important wildlife sanctuary that was just declared, which is the Kaveri Wildlife Sanctuary. Also, we understood its location and its significance. So as a whole, we had covered about this wildlife sanctuary and also we had seen its location. So you can attempt any preliminary type of question. Also, you can utilize these points to show how a state is enhancing its conservation policy or conservation efforts. Okay. So these key points in mind. Now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Have a look at this news article. See, recently researchers have discovered a new species of estuarine crab at the mangroves of Parangi Petai near the Vella River in Kadalu district. The species has been named Pseudohelis anomaly. Now, this news is more important because this is the first time this genus Pseudohelis is connected from high intertidal areas. So, in this background, let us know few facts about the species and we should also see about the estuarine ecosystem. As you can see in this image, the Pseudohelis anomaly is distinguished by dark purple to dark grey with irregular light brown, yellowish brown or white patches on the posterior carapace with light brown chelipids. The new species is small and has a maximum width of up to 20 mm and they inhabit muddy banks of mangroves and the burrows were located near the nematophores of Avicenia mangroves. So now I have a task for you. Go and find what is this nematophore of Avicenia mangroves. 
coming back this species is not aggressive and they can move fast like other intertidal crabs as many as 17 species of intertidal crabs have been recorded in the same region now my question is what are this estuary and estuarine ecosystem see estuaries form a transition zone or you can say this is a echo tone between river environments and maritime environments that is it is an area where a freshwater river or stream meets the ocean when freshwater and sea water combine the water becomes brackish or slightly salty here the difference between the delta and the estuary is that deltas form at the mouth of the rivers that transport enough sediment to build outward in contrast the estuaries are present where the oceans or lake waters flood up into the river valley the key difference between the two is where the sediment transported by the river is deposited okay so the estuarine ecosystem is formed due to the mixture of fresh water draining from the land and salty sea water and all the plants and animals in the estuaries are subjected to variations in salinity to which they are adapted this is called as osmoregulation okay because of this reason no they are the most productive water bodies in the world and now let us see some of the importance of this estuarine ecosystem Firstly since an estuary has very little wave action it provides a calm refuge from the open sea and becomes ideal for the survival of numerous aquatic species see estuaries store and recycle nutrients trap sediments and forms a buffer between coastal catchments and the marine environment and they also absorb trap and detoxify pollutants acting as a natural water filter Then the estuaries with their wetlands, creeks, lagoons, mangroves and seagrass beds, they are rich in natural resources including fisheries. Okay? So that's all about this news article. See through this news article discussion, we had covered about a new species of estuarine crab at the mangroves of Parangipetai. Then we also saw about this estuary and the estuarine ecosystem. We also saw its significance, right? So all these know is very important when you get a question in environment topic like this you will be easily able to handle such kind of questions with this information okay so with these key points in mind now let's move on to the next news article discussion have a look at this news article this article here says that a recent study from the bose institute in kolkata has revealed that aerosol pollution in west bengal is anticipated to rise by 8% and it will continue to remain in the highly vulnerable red zone so this is the second highest forecasted aerosol pollution level in the country that is after bihar so this is the crux of the news article given here and in this context let us understand about aerosol pollution and some important points mentioned in the news article see first of all what is aerosol aerosols are minute particles suspended in the atmosphere see our atmosphere is made up of gases primarily and in addition to the gases the atmosphere also contains small liquid droplets and solid particles these are very small liquid droplets and solid particles that are lightweight so that they can float in the air for a long time without falling to the ground and these tiny particles suspended in gases in atmosphere is what called as aerosol now you should know how tiny particles are there in the atmosphere See, it is because of volcanic ash, desert dust, mineral dust, sea spray, wildfire, etc., etc. And note that human-made aerosols are also there. It is formed as a result of industrial activities such as burning of coal and oil, etc. And what do you think is the effects caused by these aerosols? See, the direct effect of aerosol is based on the ability of the particulate matter to scatter sunlight back into space. So, it results in cooling effect. Apart from this, there is also an indirect effect. They severe as cloud condensation nuclei. In order to form clouds, our atmosphere needs two major ingredients. One is the water vapor, and the other one is the aerosol particles. When the water vapor is cooled it needs a surface to condense on so the aerosol particles act as this surface and allows the water vapor to condense on to them to form clouds these are positive effects now coming to the negative ones high aerosol amounts include particulate matter that is pm 2.5 and pm 10 
consisting of sea salt, dust, sulfate, black and organic carbon. See these aerosols contribute to a variety of human health problems and that is exactly why there are norms to maintain the aerosol level in a certain location. Here you should know one term aerosol optical depth. It is the quantitative estimate of the aerosol present in the atmosphere and it can be used as a proxy measurement of PM 2.5. See the values of aerosol optical depth range from 0 to 1. See, 0 indicates a crystal clear sky with maximum visibility and a value of 1 indicates very hazy conditions. This aerosol optical depth values less than 0 0.3 fall under the green zone, which is the safest zone. Then the values between 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 is blue zone, which is less vulnerable. And then take the values between 0 0.4 to 0 0.5, that is orange, and this is the vulnerable zone. And take the values over 0.5, it is the red zone that is highly vulnerable. Do you remember today's article? Yes, it is Kolkata's aerosol pollution that is anticipated to rise by 8% and continue to remain in the highly vulnerable red zone. So now you know the intensity of the issue. So measures should be taken immediately to improve the conditions in Kolkata and Bihar. So that's all about this news article. Now I have a task for you. Comment the permissible limits for PM 2.5 and the PM 10 that is particulate matter 2.5 and particulate matter 10 as per national ambient air quality standards. Okay. See this is very important viewers. That is why I am insisting you to take this as a task and do it. Okay. So with these key points in mind, now let's move on to the next part of the news article discussion, which is the preliminary practice question discussion. See, today we are going to deal with six questions in which four I will be discussing and two will be a quiz question for you. Don't worry for quiz question, whichever topic I had covered only, the question will be based on. Okay. Now let's move on to the first question. See, this question is regarding the India State Support Program. Okay, now we are going to start with the first statement. This program for the road safety is financed by Ministry of Road Transport and Highways. See, this statement is incorrect because the India State Support Program for Road Safety is financed by the World Bank and not the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways. See, the loan is from International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and it has a maturity of 18 years including a grace period of 5.5 years. Okay, so statement 1 is incorrect. Just by knowing this, you can eliminate 3 options and arrive at the answer easily because the question is demanding for correct statements. See here you can eliminate option A, C, D and arrive at the answer which is option B, 2 and 3 only. But though we have arrived at the answer, let's look into the statement 2 and 3. Statement 2 says that currently this program is being implemented in the states of Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, Odisha, Tamil Nadu, Telangana, Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal. Yes, this statement is correct. And in the third statement, a nationalized crash database system will be established under the program to construct better and safer roads. Yes, this statement is also correct. See, the project will focus on strengthening and streamlining the management capability of the lead agencies for road safety in these states. So, to reduce incidence of road crashes, the project will establish a national harmonized crash database system and the analysis of which will be used to construct better and safer roads. See, the project will also provide incentives to states to leverage private funding through public-private partnership concessions and also through the pilot initiatives. Okay. So, that's all regarding this question. So, through this question, we covered a topic called India State Support Program. Okay. With this, now let's move on to the second question. See, the second question is regarding the wildlife sanctuaries. First statement says that, the area where animals are kept for public exhibition is what called as wildlife sanctuary. See, this statement is wrong because the statement is the exact definition of a zoo. Wildlife sanctuaries are the areas where wild animals are protected in their natural habitats. Okay, here hunting or poaching practices are prohibited. So, that is why I said statement 1 is wrong. Okay. Now moving on to the second statement, both central and state government can declare an area as national park or wildlife sanctuary. See this statement is correct. 
Because both the central government and state government can declare an area as national park or wildlife sanctuary. But they do that only after consultation with the national board for wildlife and state board for wildlife. Okay. So now look at the question. The question is demanding for correct statements. So your answer here will be option B. Two only is the correct statement. Okay. See in our today's discussion, we saw about the Kaveri South Wildlife Sanctuary. So in connection with that only, I covered how a wildlife sanctuary can be defined and who can declare it as a wildlife sanctuary. Okay. Now moving on to the third question. See this third question is a pair based question. On one side exercise is given and on the other side country is involved is given. See all these are military exercises, okay? So if you look at the pairs, you know just Garuda because today we saw about Garuda, you know about that. Except that anything else do you know? No, right? So let's analyze this question and know about the rest of the military exercises and countries involved. Then what about Garuda? For that, the countries involved will be India and France and not India and Germany. So that pair is wrong. Okay. Now look at the first pair. See the pitch black is air excise between India and Australia. So that pair is correct. And this excise pitch black 22 was hosted by the Royal Australian Air Force at its Darwin Air Base. And it was done this year. Okay. Now coming to the third pair, Gymex. See, Gymex is a naval exercise between India and Japan, okay, and not India and South Korea. So, this pair is incorrect. See, the sixth edition of Japan India Maritime Exercise 2022, Gymex 2022, was hosted by Indian Navy in the Bay of Bengal in the month of September, okay. Now, moving on to the fourth pair, it is Yudh Abhyas. See, Yudh Abhyas is conducted by the Indian Army and the US Army. So, this pair is correct. Okay. It is a high altitude military exercise that was conducted between 14th to 31st of October 2022 in Uttarakhand. Okay. Now, what about the answer for this question? See, two pairs were correct. One was pitch black and the other one was Yudh Abhyas. Okay. The rest Garuda and Jimex are wrong. Because for Garuda, it is India and France and for Jimex, it is India and Japan. Okay. So, the answer for this question is option B, only two pairs are correct. And with this now, let's move on to the fourth question. See, it is regarding the G20 common framework. Okay. Two statements are given. So, I am going to go through both statements before arriving at the answer. Now, look at the first statement. It is an initiative endorsed by the G20 together with the Paris Club. See, this statement is correct. See, the common framework for debt treatment is an initiative endorsed by the G20 together with the Paris Club. Okay. And its intent is to deal with insolvency and support low-income countries with unsustainable debt. So, we can say that the second statement is also correct because it says that it is an initiative to support low-income countries with unsustainable debt. Okay. And here you can ask, what is this Paris Club? See, Paris Club is nothing but a club or group of officials from major creditor countries. It was established in the year 1956 and its aim is to find sustainable solutions to the difficulties faced by debtor countries in payments. Okay. Now, coming back to the question, it is demanding for correct statements. So, your answer here will be option C. Both 1 and 2 are correct. So, that's all for today's prelims practice question. And displayed here are two quiz questions for you. See, go through the question. If you have any doubt regarding the question, go back and watch the discussion based on these questions. You will be definitely able to answer these questions. And I expect you all to post your answers in the comment section and wait for the correct answer to be posted in the comment section itself. And interested aspirants can attend the poll because both the questions will be available as a poll question also. Displayed here is a mains question for you. Go through the question and try writing answer for this question. It will be really helpful for your mains preparation. And that's all for today's Hindu newspaper analysis. If you like this video, do like, share and comment. And don't forget to subscribe to the Shankara Academy's YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.